a home that had been her livelihood ever since I was born. And though she was vigilant and overprotective, she wasn't what you would call coddling. She wasn't what I would call a mommy mom, which is what I envy most of my friends for having. A mommy mom who is someone who takes a liking to everything her child has to say, even when there's no actual way she gives a shit. Who whisks you away to the doctor when you complain of the slightest ailment. Who tells you they're just jealous if someone makes fun of you, or you always look beautiful to me, even if you don't. Or I love this when you give them a piece of crap for Christmas. But every time I got hurt, my mom was livid, as if I had maliciously damaged her property. Once, when I was climbing a tree in the front yard, the knock I used to hoist myself up came out from under my foot. I slid two feet, dragging the skin of my bare stomach on the coarse bark, falling six feet onto my ankle. Crying, ankle twisted, shirt ripped, my stomach scraped and bloody on either side. I was not scooped into my mother's arms and taken to a medical professional. Instead, she descended upon me like a murder of crows. How many times mommy say stop climbing that tree? She hovered over my crumpled body, screeching relentlessly as I writhed among the dead leaves. I could have sworn she threw a few kicks in. You will have a de scar forever. I tell you, Nidia. I apologized over and over again, sobbing dramatically. I pulled myself towards the house with my elbows, gripping the dry leaves and the cold dirt as I dragged my limp leg forward. I go Tessa, that's enough. Hers was tougher than tough love. It was brutal. Industrial strength. It was a seemingly love that never gave way to an inch of weakness. It was the kind of love that saw what was best for you ten steps ahead and didn't care if it hurt like hell in the meantime. When I got hurt, my mom felt it so deeply. It was as though it were her own affliction. She was only guilty of caring too much. I realize this now only in retrospect. No one in this world would ever love me as much as my mother, and she would never let me forget it. Before we headed back to New York, I decided to go for a scrub at the Korean bathhouse where I brought my parents and Peter the day after they first met. Inside, there were a few Ajumas, older women, with sagging skin and stomachs that hung. I tried politely to avert my eyes, so sometimes I would catch them in my periphery, curious how the body ages, thinking about how I never get to see the way my mom would sag or wrinkle. After soaking for half an hour, an Ajuma dressed in a white bra with matching underwear called for me to lie on her vinyl table. She gave me a look as if she was unsure of how I'd gotten there. She was silent as she scrubbed, speaking every few minutes only to say, turn, sigh, face down. I eyed the gray threads peeling off of my body and a few waiting on the table. Curious whether there was more or less debris in the cases of her other customers. Just before the final rotation, she paused as if she had only just noticed. Are you Korean? I said, yes, I was born in Seoul. I said it as if trying to impress her, or more realistically, trying to mask my linguistic shortcomings. She looked into me as if searching for something. I knew what she was looking for. It was the same way kids at school would look at me before they asked me what I was, but from the opposite angle. She was searching for the hint of Koreanness in my face that she couldn't quite put a finger on. Something that resembled her own. Uri omma hanguk saram, apa miguk saram, I said. My mom Korean, my dad American. She closed her eyes and opened her mouth with a ah and nodded. It was ironic that I, who once longed to fit in with my white peers and desperately hoped that my Koreanness would go unnoticed, was now absolutely terrified that this 
stranger in the bathhouse couldn't see it. Your mom is Korean and your dad is American, she repeated. She began speaking quickly, and soon I was able to keep up. I mimicked the Korean mumbles of understanding, wanting so badly to keep up the charade, pretending to understand long enough to catch a glimpse of a word I recognized. But eventually she asked me a question I failed to comprehend. And then she too realized that there was nothing left for us to relate to. Nothing more we could share. Yetuda, she said. Pretty. It was the same word I heard when I was young, but now it felt different. And for the first time, it occurred to me that what she sought in my face might be fading. I no longer had someone whole to stand beside to make sense of me. I feared whatever contour or color it was that signified this precious half was beginning to wash away. As if without my mother, I no longer had a right to those parts of my face. 